All right. From London, this is the Saturday Lunch with Joseph Hammond. Good afternoon if you're in the UK, if you're anywhere else, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Joseph Hammond, primary school music and computing specialist, and today I have a very exciting guest, Emily Barden, singer, songwriter extraordinaire. We're looking forward to this one, it's going to be a very musical episode. Live from London. This is the Saturday Lunch with Joseph Hammond on Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Welcome, everybody. So, um, yeah, so I've had quite, um, last few episodes have been quite tech and computers based. And uh, I've got a couple of musical episodes coming up. And today is one of those episodes as um, I'm interviewing probably one of the best songwriters for children and young people out there. Um, Emily Barden she's um, so for those that don't know and aren't music teachers Sing Up is um, like one of the biggest websites for sing uh, for for song that containing songs for children and young people and they have this yearly event called Sing Up Day where um, they commission they commission a song for um, and they try and get as many schools, mostly in the UK, but also um, other schools across the world to learn these songs and sing them. And then those that send in videos, they put them into a, a digi choir. Um, and yeah, it's, I always, I always find it incredibly exciting. Um, so um yeah, I'm really looking forward to her being on the show. So um, while Emily um, gets ready, if if um, Emily can hear this, um, I'm ready when you are. You can call in whenever you're ready. Um, and But while she's getting that sorted, um, I'll just update you on a couple of um, things that I uh, thought this week. Um, so... Yes, it's it's the half term. It's the half term holidays, um, and it's a while off. But I've always found it really hard, or sort of really. I get very when you've built up really strong relationships with children that you teach. Um, it's really upsetting to hear that they're leaving and yeah I, I i heard that a few of the children that i'm uh that i teach are leaving um uh, well probably at the end of the year and you know these are these are kids who i've spent who i've taught music to and um you know played with and interacted with them in in many great ways over the last year and a half and yeah i i didn't i i felt really down about it actually after i heard yesterday that that some of those kids are kids are going um at the end of the year that was that was really hard to take at that was really hard to take um and i know that and my mum's always said that there will always be children that will come across and will uh, and will always uh, you'll be able to develop uh, um, relationships with new students, and um, and yeah, you'll be able to you'll you'll find new students and you'll be able to um, develop their. Um, and build up relationships with them but 
even so you really if you've had a really positive strong relationship and an in a really positive impact on a student then it is very hard to to hear that they're not they're not going to be with you and you do you do end up you do end up really really missing them uh, obviously it's a different relationship from you know fam family and things but it is even so the fact that teachers can have such a strong positive impact on their students and it, I, also students themselves can have a really such a positive impact on the teacher them uh, on the teacher themselves and i've had several students who've had a very strong impact on me where i've learned a lot from them they you know i've had a positive impact on them but they've also taught me a lot right i've got an invite i've got a call i think this is going to be emily let's see um and yeah so i just wanted to start that off um oh did that not work Hmm. Oh, hello. I can hear no oh, hello. Hello, is that Emily? It is indeed. Hello, can you hear Amazing. me? Amazing. Yes, I can. Right, everybody. Th thank Emily. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for being on the show. So. Um, this is my guest today. This is Emily Barden. She is uh, probably the best songwriter on Sing Up. Um, <laughs> she's got uh, like serious, uh, lo loads of my favorite songs on Sing Up are written by you, Emily. I'm just going to put that out there straight away. <laughs> um, go on. I was going to say that's very kind, but that you said that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So before we get into chatting with Emily, um, just wanted to play um, a showreel that she sent me of um, six of her, uh, her songs from Sing Up. So enjoy. Hey, oh, hey, oh.
Oh man, that do you know what? Listening to that back, that brings back some memories of leading sing up days, and uh, that's so yeah. That's been that was that was very nostalgic to listen to some of those again. Um, so yeah, welcome Emily. Thanks for coming to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Um, it was really nice being able to put those songs together. I've never actually done that where you sort of do little snippets of the things that you've done and put them all together. So it was a lovely process to remember all of those different mm. songs and why why I was asked to do them and think about all the briefs that I got given and, you know, how I had to troubleshoot all of those things. And it was really great, actually. So thank you for, uh, for <laughs> making me do that. <laughs> Jens, do you know what? From because uh, I know more recently you've sort of sung the demo tracks for like for We Are Unstoppable. Uh, you uh, you sang that throughout. Whereas when you did the earlier ones, like Can You Hear My Voice and uh, and um, One and a Million, you had the children singing. So it was really interesting hearing some of the older sing update songs sung by you. I've not heard that before. Yeah, I mean, quite often that's a, a time sort of thing. I mean, ideally, the whole thing with Sing Up is that they try to have children's, well, you'll know, they try to have children's voices singing children's songs so that they're immediately relatable for the young people that are listening to them. But whenever there's a Sing Up Day song, um, time is of the essence to sort of get that yeah. out there and promote it. So, um, yeah, I quite often have to provide a sort of a, a demo audio of me singing it. And then the intention is always that the uh, that it will be re-recorded by a children children's choir so that you can actually hear what it's going to be like with your young people but um I don't write anything that I don't love singing so it's for me it's a yeah. real joy to be able to actually do those vocal tracks because fundamentally if I don't like singing it then I don't think that the kids are going to like singing it so I have to write stuff that I enjoy yeah and I guess I guess for we are unstoppable with covid and everything I guess it was really difficult to pull off getting it recorded by a children's choir yeah, I mean, there's been a whole lot of logistics stuff. I mean, I think teachers have been remarkable at, um, you know, overcoming all sorts of very strange circumstances in the last two years and finding ways to make things work. I mean, I was just thrilled that in any sense, singing still was able to happen because obviously when COVID hit, singing became like the like the worst thing that you could do, according to the media. Oh, I suddenly gosh, became yeah. like a, a terrible person because all I do is <laughs> sing with people. So trying to find a way to keep that going and to keep young people singing I think you know well done to everybody out there that's managed to keep that part of the curriculum by singing outside you know in, in the playground mm. raining <laughs> all the different yeah. ways people did and um, I don't know if you saw the um, sing up day video from last year when they put it all together and watching all the people in covid times singing unstoppable but I thought yeah. the video was fantastic it was so powerful watching all these people Liberty how- Woodland School is my school Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, fabulous. Well, I've seen you. Yeah. So, um, so no, I, I was actually, and funny enough, that was the first time that I'd actually, we'd, that in a school I've worked at, that I'd actually been able to send a video off. Um, because due to the nature of my, my school, Liberty Woodland School is a weird school. It's a very progressive school. We, okay. everything, every, we have 60 pupils. Everything takes place outdoors. 
Um, so, you know, we were prepared for that already. <laughs> you were perfectly set up for it. Well, well yeah. done. Our, our biggest problem was that we have some school chickens and we were hoping they would be quiet. That was our <laughs> biggest problem. <laughs> I tell you what, that's funny because I've got chickens and um, they actually, just before I came on this with you, I was running around the garden shepherding them back again because I didn't want them to make a noise during this broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was I mean we've moved to a new site now and the chickens have stayed with my head teacher however <laughs> like that was always quite a funny thing we would have the whole day with constant ah, 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 <laughs> all the time well, um, that would only have added to the atmosphere yeah it's like an episode <laughs> of the archers <laughs> um so yeah no um so as I say that you've written um you've written most of the songs for Sing Up Day, haven't you? All but all but two, I think. Is that right? I've sort of lost count of how many I've done, but I've certainly done quite a few. Um, there are some other songwriters like Lynn Marsh and Becky Owen yeah. um, and Sharon Durant who have also written things. Oh, and I think has Fiona Lander done one? I'm not sure. Um, there's lots of other really very lovely, very good songwriters on Sing Up that, that have done some stuff. Yeah. But yes, I have done proportionally more um Mm. which I think I think it's because it's such a big ask in terms of what the song has to do I mean if you saw the brief that I get given it's hilarious really the the amount of problems that you've got to solve in one song (laughs) it's like has to be singable by a five-year-old has to be singable by an 18-year-old has to be (laughs) has to be relevant to a five-year-old has to be relevant to a secondary school choir you know has to have harmony has to be in unison (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's sort of it's a really I really enjoy it because I, I really like problem solving it's a it's a good thing um so I enjoy them but a very demanding job at the same time yeah satisfying when you think you might have nailed it though when you think oh this might just do the job so yeah it's it's a joy to be part of do you do you have more freedom for the non-sing update songs that you've written for the site yeah absolutely I mean it works um one of two ways I mean Sing Up is a commissioning organisation who will decide um, what they need a song for and then they will contact an appropriate person or they also um, sort of take submissions from people who if you've written stuff and you think Sing Up might like this they will have a listen and if they like it they'll pop it on their site so I actually started off my life with Sing Up by me just sending stuff because I've written songs forever and ever so I just sent them some stuff that I'd done for, for kids and said you might like this and they said, yes, we do. And so they put that. So things like Try Your Best um, and, in fact, Can You Hear My Voice were not written for Sing Up. I'd written them and sent them to Sing Up. Um, ah, nice. And then it was through that that they, they got to know me and the, the style of work I do. And then they started commissioning, saying things like, we'd really like um, a song that would be appropriate for Easter, but that is not necessarily mentioning um, religion. But th- so that's where New Beginning came from. Um, that was a specific commission to write something for the Easter time. Um, and so I went with spring and the idea of, you know, rebirth more generally. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's how it comes about. It can be either they they ask you to write something or you can send existing material that you know is going to work with young people's voices. Yeah, it says, um, you know, thank uh, one one uh, song that, we haven't mentioned yet and wasn't on the reel. Thank your lucky stars. Oh, has I forgot become... about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, lucky stars has become a regular um, favourite of um, you know harvest uh, festivals for when whenever wherever I'm teaching. Oh, brilliant! Um, yeah, that was a really fun one to write with the uh, the whole cumulative thing about um, adding a little bit each time because again, that was I have to try and work out ways to write songs that are easy for uh, non-music specialist teachers to teach. Um, So they're not too complicated, but that are complicated enough that they keep everybody interested across the whole of the primary school spectrum. Because, I mean, you'll know, year sixes, you know, they're pretty clued up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, they are. To try and do something that that still keeps a year six engaged. So I sort of went with the whole almost tongue twistery thing of building up cumulative things at the end of the verses for Thank You Lucky Stars because it made me laugh trying to do it and I thought okay if it makes me laugh it'll probably make somebody else laugh so oh that's that's, okay that's really (laughs) interesting and you know what what a challenge I mean having to (laughs) 
uh, having to both make it easy enough so younger people can sing it and uh challenging enough in some way so that it can be it can be a thing that old older people or more advanced singers can sing that wow what a challenge <laughs> yeah it's a great it's a great challenge it's the thing that i like and it's where things like harmony really come into play so if you can write a strong unison song but with some optional harmony parts or additional lines or like uh, maybe even like a body percussion or a beatboxing line something that you know that the key stage 2 teachers are going to hear and think okay so this is what we're going to do with this older group of children. I always like to try and add something that if you take it away, it doesn't matter. It still stands up as a song. But if you add it, it really makes it just that little extra bit special and can and can span the key stages. Yeah. So you, you mentioned harmony. And this is, I guess, as a specialist music teacher, I want, to, I want my kids to be able to harmonize. But honestly... It is one thing that I find the most difficult aspect to teach. So, and you're obviously, you're a choral leader as well. So how do you approach teaching harmony, especially with primary school children? It is, um, it is a difficult thing to do. And it is something that some children are more naturally um, attuned to doing, um, but it also comes with practice. But there are ways into harmony that don't mean you have to immediately sing like a parallel harmony, which is the hardest thing to do. And I noticed that with my community singers that I work with as well, that actually um, if they're singing a, a bespoke part that is a different shape from another part, they're much more able to do that. As soon as you are trying to sing the same line, but just on a different start note, so proper parallel chordal harmony, that is the most difficult thing to do because you've got to be able to pick out different pitches happening at the same time. So a way in, I always think that the best way in is through rounds because rounds create harmony quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and they sound cool, but fundamentally, everybody's learning the same thing. You're just starting at a different time. And then layered songs are also really good. So partner <coughs> songs, things that work over the same chord sequence, but that are it's essentially two different songs. There's a really famous one on Sing Up, which is the um, gospel medley, where you sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, um, or When the Saints Go Marching In, and I Want to Sing, I Want to Dance. They're three separate songs that all work over the same chord pattern. And so three groups sing three songs at the same time, and you get fabulous harmony, but yeah. you don't have to worry about trying to locate where you are in that sort of harmonic pattern because you're just singing your song. So I do think that that's mm -hmm. a really good way in. Um, and then as you sort of progress and, and as their ears and as their listening improves, because that's actually what harmony is most about. It's not about singing. It's about listening. Yeah. So the more listening activities um, young people can be doing and trying to pick out notes within a chord and, and sort of playing with sound. I think that that really helps get their ears used to working in harmony. Okay. Yeah. Cause I have, I have taught with round rounds and partner songs um, before, and it's just something that I guess I've noticed even in big, um, when I've done Albert Hall galas and things mm. and you get, um, the ambition is to have, you know, schools on one side of the Albert Hall singing where the melody line and the other side singing the harmony. But often it's so easy to default to the tune again. You know, they can sing the notes yeah. when you rehearse it individually. But yeah. then when you try and put it together for them to stay on that. That's that's a tough challenge is what I found. It can be a tough challenge. And things like uh, making your harmony line, again, a different shape to your melody line. So if you take New Beginning in the chorus, when I've got the um, <coughs> flowers are growing and the birds are singing, at the same time, there's a part that goes, warm days, we say spring. Yeah. So that is a different shape. So actually one hand of the conductor can be making that very definite shape at that group who are singing the harmony and whilst yeah. the other group are singing the main melody. I think visualizing stuff and also physicalizing stuff is, is really helpful. Um, I move a lot when I um, direct singing. I can't help it because I really find <laughs> that um, using your body 
it helps internalize the sound for me, but it also really helps uh, children and community choir grown-ups to be able to follow the shapes and patterns that you are doing. And I actually encourage um, young people when they're learning and singing to draw the shape of the melody with their hand as they're singing it. Because for some children, that actually, that sort of makes it make sense, being able to see the highs, the lows, the longs, the shorts. And if they can do it as well as the conductor, um, for some children, that will be the way in. Yeah. And I, we did, I, I did manage it with one and a million and be the change. I think because for one, uh, for be the change, I remember uh, I had another adult that was able to conduct the choir who were doing the, um, the higher harmony. Yeah. And uh, then I could conduct the most, uh, the majority of the kids. And yeah. then, um, and they, the kids managed to do that. I intended to have the uh, adults um, do the lower harmony. Yeah. But I guess since they weren't used to regular singing, um, I did, did try to get them to do the, be the change, yeah. gonna be the change at the end. But then they, they, they did it when we rehearsed it, but then defaulted to the melody. But the kids managed it because I guess we had the two adult conductors who were able to lead in that lead in that sense. Absolutely. Um, and like you say, you're working regularly with the children, but I bet you're not working regularly <laughs> with the grown-ups. And so the grown-ups' no. ears probably aren't as good as the children's ears at picking stuff up because the children are used to the way you're working with them. And it is so much about listening um, and, and, and practising. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, with with one and a million, as you say, because the um, while the in the second verse – um while um the I am a rose in a garden and yeah. then under underneath or above that is going one and a million. I that was easier to do because it was two different lines. So you could get, you know, the year threes and fours singing the melody, the year fives and sixes singing the uh that that higher higher harmony part. Yeah, um, I think so that's been I think that's been quite a popular one for that very reason that you can get quite a, a choral sound quite quickly, um, either across a whole school singing, or I know it's used quite often in things like big sings, or when you're getting lots of different groups of children together, um, transition yeah. projects where you're taking your year sixes up to your year sevens, and the year sevens can yeah. be singing the, the harmony part. I know it has been used quite widely for like mass singing because I think of that harmony option. I think is it I, I guess so I guess one and a million is is would that be your most popular song would you say it's hard to know really what your most popular one is I know that one and a million people talk to me about one and a million which I suppose yes that that must mean that they're they're using it and I get a lot of feedback about one and a million um yeah. be the change has been used by uh, quite a lot of um groups outside of school so it's been used by um, an environmental sort of campaign group um, to try and raise awareness about uh, environmental problems and, and global warming and climate change. Nice. Um, mm -hmm. So that's nice to know that it has a life outside of school as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, I think that they all get used in, in a variety of ways. And to be honest, I don't really mind which one people prefer. <laughs> I'd, I'd like them to just be there um, as a, a way to sort of solve problems <laughs> Um, like what can we do for harvest or, oh, I'd like a song about spring or, oh, we need a song about friendship or any of those <laughs> things that me and a teacher goes, oh, yes, this does the job, then that makes me very happy. <laughs> yeah, because um, I, I was just thinking, because you mentioned Lynn Marsh and I've got Lynn Marsh on the show in two weeks' time, oh, um, which is cool. Um, but like Lynn Marsh, she's written loads of obviously big songs, but believe is her biggest yeah. song by a long shot it is it's the anthem isn't it it's um it is absolutely the anthem. <laughs> fantastic and again that works that's got a similar feature of having an optional um harmony line that really sort of brings it to life um and works really well in a, in a sort of big sing setting yeah um cool and i i sort of thinking about the way you two i mean would you say this is accurate like i'd say you have a much more modern approach to your songwriting, contemporary, I should say, approach. Lynn Marsh has much more of a traditional approach. Would you say that's accurate? I think what's probably accurate is that we both write 
from where we come from. So um, I am a sort of singer songwriter, rock and pop guitar playing girl who's grown up in bands and gigging around the north of England. That is that is where I am from. And yeah. so when I when I write for young people, I don't put on any really sort of a different hat other than yeah. I'm writing a song. I mean, lyrically, I I make more um I'm thinking more about the young people and, 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 you know, maybe thinking about where the melody sits in terms of a young person's vocal range. But in terms of the way I write melody and the style of the song, I only write stuff that I would be happy singing anyway. So you might be right then that that makes mine sound more like a contemporary style because that's how I, that's how I write my own material. Um, and I know that Lynn Marsh comes from a sort of um, a, a musical, she's got a strong musical theatre and a performance, song performance, um, and also an education background. So that might, that might be more where she is coming from. But okay. I think you, you can't do anything that's not really authentically you because I think the children can sniff it out a mile away. I think mm. they know when something is pretend <laughs> so I yeah. hope that the children can feel that I'm having a lovely time writing and singing these songs I hope that that is infectious um, yeah do you know and do you know what you make a very good point there because I've I've said when I've had adults sort of ask me to do certain songs and I've said like if I can't get passionate about this song then it's just not gonna work for the kids because if I'm not passionate about it, then they're not gonna they're not gonna they're not gonna pick up they're going to pick up on that and they're gonna do it half heartedly. Absolutely. They are just a mirror to um, you know, well, you are a mirror to them. So if you sort of project, <laughs> you know, that you're really behind something and that you're really positive about something, then I think that that is genuinely what you get back from the young people. Mm. And uh, I, I've um, got a fun story to tell you, actually, and <laughs> and uh, and the people listening. Um, so there was one time when um, a head teacher I used to work for wanted to do an assembly about um, forgiveness and saying sorry, and uh, you know, apologising for your mistakes. And the song she wanted me to do was Justin Bieber's "Sorry." Oh. Yeah, and I, I had to, and I had to say um, no, no, just <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> and, uh, I was just thinking. I mean, she did notice the line about um, you know, oh, I love your body and things, and so I was, yeah. oh, we need to change that. But even so, could you? I could just see in my head. Oh, today, kids, we're going to. Whoop. Uh, hello. That's somebody at my door, but I'll just let them stay there. <laughs> okay, and um, and yeah, I could just imagine in my head um, the year, especially my year six is. Oh, today, kids, we're going to do a Justin Bieber song, and I, I, could, I could just imagine them eating me alive at that point. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Right, um, we're going to take, if you want to answer that, I'm going to take play the uh, adverts um, okay. last about a minute or two. Uh, so take a bit of a break and then we'll come back. This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you, too, through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles, and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.withaslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. Introducing Uplearn. Uplearn is an online curriculum learning resource for A-levels that improves student outcomes whilst reducing teacher workloads. Teachers use Uplearn to facilitate independent learning and consolidation of classroom material. Over 150 schools have seen grade improvements with Uplearn, including St Paul's Girls School, Michaela Community School and ARC Schools. Book a demo at uplearn.co.uk and quote TTR for 10% off. That's Uplearn, 
uplearn.co.uk. Whatever learning looks like this year, bring lessons to life with Nearpod. An exciting new addition to the Renaissance family, Nearpod offers real time insights into student understanding through interactive lessons and videos, gamification, and activities, all in a single, easy to use platform. To help kickstart the new year, we're offering all primary and secondary schools in the UK and Ireland full free access to Nearpod for the whole spring term. So, no matter what 2022 brings, Nearpod makes switching between in-class and remote teaching simple. Visit www.renlearn.co.uk forward slash Nearpod and sign up for your free trial today. If you're listening to this, then we know we share one thing in common, a passion for the type of outstanding education that every child deserves. That's what makes us the leading provider of specialist education and care. We need people like you to help us achieve even more. With us, you'll be given all the resources and support you need, offered a clear path to career progression, and be rewarded with some of the best salaries and benefits the industry has to offer. We are with a Slack group. If you'd like to find out more, we'd love to hear from you. Visit www.withaslackgroup.co.uk forward slash careers and be part of our future. Okay, and we're back. Um, cool. Hello. Hi. Um, okay, so... Um, where were we? We were um, talking a bit about we were talking about uh, not singing Justin Bieber in your yes, school. Yes, we were. <laughs> yes, we were. We were definitely talking about that. No, do not. Please don't do that. Anybody <laughs> who's listening ever. Um, so I want to go to, I guess, your background. So you mentioned that you um, came from a place of gigging and uh, in the north of England. And um, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, I have always written songs. So <clears throat> since being, I grew up in Northumberland, um, and yeah, I just always used to respond to anything in my life by writing a song about it. Um, I had some. I, I went to middle school. It was a strange format of um, schools up in uh, Northumberland, where it was first, middle, and high. So I went in middle school. Um, I had some really supportive teachers actually, who would let me write songs in response to sort of projects and things like that and actually I wrote two of the school musicals when I was at middle school and I nice. also um, wrote a business plan and took it to the head teacher to ask them to fund me going to a recording studio to record some of my songs and said wow. everything I sold the school would get the profit so I was about 11 when I did that um, and it was <laughs> I think I sort of peaked wow. at 11 uh, but it was really great because I had a school that allowed me to do that they sort of took me seriously um, and allowed me to do my creative thing, which was just a joy. And it meant that I've never, ever thought that there's anything odd or strange or unviable about making music all the time. That's and actually brilliant. as a living, it was a, a wonderful way to be, you know, to be educated, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that there is that space at the moment um, for I, I, I wonder what 11 year old me would be like now at school. I wonder how. I wonder how I would be allowed to get on in the way that I did, you know, when I was at school. Yeah, well, I mean, I can say for sure, if you were taught by me, you'd only get encouragement. Um, but I mean, it's, um, but yeah, I know what you mean, because, um, and it's it's a combination of lots of things. And I've, I've, taught, I've talked about this with many, many people before that, you know, the, I, I think, you know, the majority of teachers in in there is, are saying there's like there's too much focus on exams results league tables and when you have that it's very it's it's very restrictive for mm. people that do want to take things in a creative direction like you i i can see that you know your background helped you get to where you are today whereas um <clears throat> i'm just thinking about how many people out there might have a similar passion to yours but won't get the chance to explore it because they don't have the encouragement from their yeah. school or their adults and that 
does make me feel a bit sad, actually. Absolutely. Them. I think that that probably is, <laughs> is the case. Um, and I, the work that I do when I'm not writing songs for, for Sing Up or for other people is I, I do a lot of work songwriting with young people um, and working with schools or organisations trying to um, help children access uh, songwriting in the in the way that that I did um because because I'm not sure there is the space uh, within sort of normal curriculum time that I was lucky enough to have um and it meant that when I went to uh university <coughs> I chose to go to Lippa which is the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts which uh, mm-hmm. was set up by Paul McCartney in Liverpool nice and mm-hmm. and I was able to do a degree that actually specialized in singing and songwriting so I spent three years at university doing a music degree but that my focus was always on singing and songwriting so really this yeah. is something that is like it just deeply <laughs> ingrained in me and how I process the world so to be able to do that um for a living but also be able to do that with young people um for me is is I really enjoy working with with children and uh, and teenagers and helping them helping them explore how amazing music can be and that sort of like light bulb moment where they do something and they begin to realize that they can do it it's just it's really sort of quite transformative i love it yeah and so so you like cuz you've studied it all the time i shouldn't feel bad if my songs aren't as good as yours <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, no, I like to think that this is something that I am genuinely qualified to do. So I'm not, um, I've done a lot of work in education, but I'm not a qualified teacher. I've never done a sort of teaching uh, qualification. I've done a lot of practical stuff. So experience wise, I feel like I've got quite a lot of um, you know, education experience. But what I'm not is a qualified teacher. What I am is I'm a qualified songwriter. Yeah. <laughs> and that really feels like, um, you know, with places like Sing Up, it's, um, they, uh, asking people to write music for education who are songwriters, um, which I think is really important because it mm. means that, you, like you're saying, you get quality songs that are meant for young voices, not not just your Justin Bieber sing-alongs. Yeah. Um, and what actually, one of the first things that I did with Liberty Woodland School when I joined them in September 2020 was with our key stage two kids. I worked with the class teacher and we um, we wrote a school song. Um, and it turned out all right, I think. And, Excellent. So is that going to stay in school? Is that going to be something that yeah. gets taught to every year as they come yeah. up? Yes, Fab. it is. And, do you know, the thing is, we, uh, the thing that um, what, I'm on the autistic spectrum and one of my weaknesses is words. So... Mm. And so, but that was re- a really helpful process with the school song because the class teacher could focus on the lyric writing and that left me to be able to focus on the, the it was kind of like an Elton John, Bernie Torbin uh, <laughs> relationship there. Excellent. The kids wrote the words and, uh, you know, I, I then was able to help work with the kids to put those words to music and structure the song properly and uh, take influence. Actually, I think it turned out all right. That's fantastic. Um, That's a really good process. And I also love the way that um, children come up with um, turns of phrases or observations that I would never make. So when I'm sort of working with young people and writing a song, um, the sort of the way in which they come up with lyrics and words is completely different to how I would do it and quite often much better so I, mm-hmm. I also really enjoy that process of handing over the lyrical content to um, whoever it is that is going to be singing that song and I also find that then they sing much more uh, with much more conviction and passion if they've written the words people quite often ask me about how do you get your six boys to sing I don't know it seems to be a general thing um, yeah. that people are struggling with and my answers are get them to write it, get them to own it, get it to be what they want to sing, get it to be what they want to say, and they're more likely to make a noise when they sing it. As long as it's not inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> That's where your teacher moderation comes in, doesn't it? Yeah. But actually, you know, who knows what actually is going on in their head and what they'd like to write about. So why not yeah. take the chance to find out? Yeah. And um yeah it is it is a gen it is a thing with year six boys and singing that that is uh is better on the primary age and in secondary age just kind of well 
year year se- year seven to to ten, I guess. When you reach year eleven and sixth form, you're more confident in who you want to be as a person. That's what yeah. I found anyway. Absolutely. But um, but yeah, I I have had some year six boys that have been really committed to choir and um and and singing with so I've been very lucky in that sense um and I guess one of the biggest things that I've tried to make sure that we do is create an atmosphere where it's you know not a toxic thing that you're going to get bullied for if you're a boy who sings or or if you're if that's where you're interests lie which I think is one of the biggest fears for boys of that age absolutely and they've got you as a role model I think that you can't underestimate the power of seeing another man singing if you're a boy Mm. and you're sort of thinking is this something that I do actually the fact that you're there modeling it and living it I think that's a really it's a really powerful thing yeah and as as what I say to people because my other specialist subject is computing and ICT and I always always say that like yeah my roles are often so important because I can speak from a place of experience um as well as um you know push forward the the importance of um of you know having that those be a big part of our of our education yeah, um, they're very complementary, aren't they? The ICT, the technology, and music go very well together. And they're and they're often the subjects that primary class teachers fear to teach the most, mo- mostly because oh, yeah. they are not confident in them themselves. Yeah, um, and I guess it's up to people like us to work really hard to improve that confidence and make it accessible. I think you're right. I think confidence is such an important word um, with teachers and with and with young people that it's, a, yeah, having the confidence to have a go, having the confidence to make a bit of a mess of it as well and it not being a problem. The whole, you know, having confidence to do something not great the first time, um, but know that you can do it again and get better. I think it's, it's really important. Yeah. All right. Um, so... Have now you obviously you've done a lot of songwriting. Um, have you ever had writer's block before? Um, I think I would call it lack of inspiration rather than writer's block. Um, yeah, yes, definitely. I mean, there are times where you sort of think the last thing you want to do is to write a song. Um, and I've addressed that myself by seeking out other people people actually I think the answer for that lies in 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 other people so um I've taken myself off on a couple of songwriting retreats where you go and stay in a house with other songwriters and um and learn from mentors that's the other thing I think it's a you're constantly learning and constantly um trying to improve your own craft there's no way I think that I've got this nailed um and so I'm always actively seeking out ways that I can get better Mm. Um, and and going and finding inspiration from other people. And whenever you do that, you always come away with um, masses of inspiration and new tricks and ideas and starters to try and get you through anything where you are thinking, oh, I just don't know if I'm ever going to write a song again, which is a genuine fear, you know, especially after you've written one that you like, you think maybe that's it. <laughs> maybe that's the yeah. last one I'm ever going to write. So um, I've learnt in the last few years, not to be such a sort of lone wolf about things, but that other people and connecting with other people is definitely the way forward. But it took me quite a long time to to learn that. Um, And I did sort of just try and sort of solve it all myself. But um, yeah, I've I've really, the last few years, I felt very inspired by, uh, by meeting other people and learning from them. Oh, that that's cool because you know I I, I get whenever I ask a composer or a songwriter that question, I get I get various responses to you know some are saying you know I've always got music in my head, it's never happened to me. Um, so so no, thank you for sharing that, and uh, I I I always I always say to people it's good to share your perhaps more vulnerable side or that side where you have struggled, and you know I've been very open about that being on the autistic spectrum I've had my own struggles in in that sense so um 
So, yeah, yeah thank you for sharing that. That's quite all right. I think it's probably good to hear that uh, actually you don't have to you don't have to do things on your own, and that it's not a sign of weakness if you ask somebody else if they've got an idea. <laughs> That's yeah. It's just it makes everybody a bit better, doesn't it? The sharing of stuff, like you say. Yeah. So, who would you say are your biggest influences and inspirations? Um, I think I'm quite an old fashioned songwriter. I know you said that um, you sort of thought I was quite contemporary and I am in style, but in the type of song that I write, as in how they're structured and how I treat melody and how singable I like things to be, that's quite an old fashioned way of writing. Um, And the people that I look to are the people who were writing back in the 60s, the people who sort of started this whole singer-songwriter genre, Um, you know, your Joni Mitchells and Carole King and James Taylor and the Beatles and um, all of these people who who are at the dawn of this idea of, um, you used the word vulnerability, I think that's quite an important one, Uh, somebody writing a song sitting down playing it and singing it to you and it and it being personal to them that whole thing that happened in in the sort of 60s I love it all and really wish I was around at that time um to be to be witness to it because I think it must have been magical yeah although I I think if you were around at that time you'd have sort of adults say oh music was better in the 50s or the <laughs> 40s and uh, it's probably always the chance isn't it people are always probably harking back to something nostalgic that they think was better um, yeah but I know I I know you meant you mentioned um you can't strive for perfection in songs I just remembered like I think it's important to know that there's no such thing as perfection when writing a song. No song can ever be perfect. Hell, there's people that even don't like Bohemian Rhapsody shock horror. <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> um, so no, that's um, so you you've got. Um, but I would say, yeah, I I can I can see if the the sort of the sixties inspirations. I think. It, it often sort of all comes to within each other without inspirations from the previous musicians we wouldn't have the more modern music and that goes right back to when music was first invented you know we wouldn't have classical music without baroque music we wouldn't have the romantic music without the classical music we wouldn't yeah. have Stravinsky's Rites of Spring without you know the stuff that came before it and uh, etc so it all it all feeds it all feeds into each other it does all feed into each other and also i think that um the people that you surround yourself with are also a huge inspiration so you know when i went to lipper i was surrounded by loads of people who could do exactly the same thing that i could do um but most of the time better so they became the inspiration because you were surrounded by peers who you looked up to, who you were thinking, wow, well, you did it like that and you've done this and and you sort of hear things and borrow things. And I think that putting yourself in an environment of people who you find inspiring is a really great way of, of learning. Mm. So, so we talked a lot about songwriting. Um, we've talked a bit about teaching harmony to young children. Let's talk a bit about um, choir, uh, lead, running choirs and leading choirs. So you said you mentioned you've got a group of community singers. Do you do any other choirs at the moment? At the moment, my regular thing is I've got a, a little, very small children's choir and I've got three adult community choirs that I run down here in West Sussex, which is where I live. Nice. Um, and then I uh, work with the local music hub to do sort of large scale singing events with groups of children from around the county. So sort of like your big sing style things. Um, but yes, I do have weekly community choirs and uh, I've run them. I think this is my 12th year of running the first one, which is called Bella Capella. They're a very wonderful group of people. And nice. the principle there is that it's uh, absolutely open access. It's for anybody, whether or not they think they can sing a note, um, whether they've ever done it before. It doesn't <coughs> care what age you are. You don't have to read music. You don't have to have any experience. You just quite simply have to have the will to uh, to come along and have a go. And um, and yeah, we actually, we have a really good time and, and I push them musically. You know, I don't think that being in a community choir means that it has to be um, any less good. I think that it should always be striving for something that's really a quality musical thing. 
it tends to be that it's just the way in which it's accessed is slightly different than if you were in a choral society or anything where you just got handed sheet music, which is not what I do at all. It's all by rote. Mm. So I sing, they listen, they copy. <laughs> and uh, we build it up and we get into, you know, four, five, six part harmony, which is really fantastic. And that's, um, I mean, I, I guess that is what uh, a cappella is. And that's, um, do you know what? Because uh, I went to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama and I said this to, I've often said this to other students or what I've seen from other students and some other musicians is, and I guess one of the reasons why I teach kids, I do teach them a bit about notation and how to read music, but it's not a focus mm-hmm. um, because... I've just seen them get so stuck to the page that they're not actually listening. And that can be a, uh, that can be a flaw in their own musical development. Like um, I, I, I'm classically trained. Um, Trombone's my first instrument. However, um, most, most of the time, I'm actually playing piano and guitar now um, because that's the requirement. And I mostly play by ear. I'm very lucky that I have perfect pitch so I can figure things out really quickly. Um, But uh, but yeah, I've often seen with music students that I guess I was very different. Um, other, Other music students on my course were very focused on they wanted to be an orchestral player on their chosen instrument. Mm. But even then, I feel like they weren't perhaps listening as much as they could. I think you're right. Listening is a key thing. It's so important. Um, and and not just sort of listening at a superficial level, but really listening and sort of delving down into what the music is doing and why it's doing that and why does it evoke the feelings that it does in in people. And I think that's something that we can be doing from babies, really. I think that it's, I think if you watch children, very young children, listen to music, they are really listening and responding mm. to it in a really sort of, authentic way and I think that that's something that maybe we lose a little bit as we sort of get older and go through the system a bit and we get we know we start being asked to you know put things in boxes a bit more but that that skill of listening I think you can't underestimate how important it is yeah I've I've often noticed when um when I've worked with the nursery kids um and sometimes well just kids in general let's say but mostly with the younger kids perhaps they're not so confident however when I then get feedback from some of the other adults or some of their parents they say oh yeah my my kid's been singing this song did you teach him that and I was like yeah I did um so you know they they I guess yeah they engage in their own way and even sometimes it's not they they're not perhaps showing in their body language in a traditional way that they're picking it up, but often yeah. they really are. Yeah, absolutely. and it can take time. <clears throat> like you're saying, that can, they can just be internalising and processing stuff, and then it can come out a bit later on. When you're not there, you, you've no idea what, you know, the impact that it's had, which is why I suppose it's so important to, to keep doing things r- regularly and keep music and access to music regular and, you know, in the school <laughs> and mm. in the curriculum because, yeah, yeah. People, people need that opportunity and, and, to engage with it. And with people who are passionate about it. Like, well, I think one of the highlights, there was this guy, a uh, bassoon player and workshop leader called Luke Crooks, who uh, was, um, he would lead loads of workshops and uh, he taught workshop leading at the Guildhall for a while. And uh, like, just he had an infectious enthusiasm that I've always tried to carry over into my own, uh, my own, my own teaching. Yeah, that's really important. I think it's really interesting you've just said that you had somebody who taught workshop leading because I think that's really good to acknowledge that it is a skill leading a workshop and, you know, something that you do need to think about and learn how to do and that, you know, not everybody can can do it. Um, and the, But the best ones uh, are really fantastic, aren't they? They're transformative when you get somebody yeah. to do a, a workshop that they're really good at it. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> thing. 
<laughs> yeah, I um, I and going 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 back to what we were talking about with engagement. Actually, what well, I guess one of the examples was there's this uh, teacher in Brighton, Anna Respach, um, that te- te- used to teach at Downs Junior School, where Howard Blake uh, went, composer oh, yeah. walking in the air, and. Uh, well, one of my favourite warm ups that she taught me is the uh, the banana song. Um, and oh, uh, the banana song. Yeah, it, you start by shouting "Bananas of the world unite!" and then you you put your hands up, you clap them together, and then you go "Peel banana, peel peel banana, peel banana, peel peel banana, chop banana, chop chop banana, chop banana, chop chop banana, scoop." banana scoop scoop banana scoop banana scoop scoop banana and there's actions that go with all of those and you carry on and then it goes blend then drink banana and then (laughs) banana and then sweet banana um it's brilliant fun um and yeah we found apparently some of my nursery kids have done renditions of that at the uh, at the uh, dinner table. Um, <laughs> I'm sure the parents are delighted. <laughs> oh yeah, one one of one of my other favourite early EYFS songs that I've done is I've got this um, song called. Um, well, actually, it's on. It, I learnt it from Sing Up. I've got a grumpy face. Yeah, but we do we do it our own we do it our own way. I get the kids to oh, what face shall we make next? Or I say who can show me this face and you know we 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 mess it up and then just each time we pick it and then we go i've got a grumpy face a grumpy face a grumpy face i've got a grumpy face it looks like this and then we just go around each time as a great fun one yeah (laughs) okay emily i'm gonna play the weekend news and um uh, adverts again and there's a bit of a technology briefing as well that'll last about eight minutes or so okay. and then we'll wrap up and then we'll wrap up the show the last part excellent this episode of teachers talk radio has been made possible with support from with slack group the uk's leading provider of sen education and care They're here to support you, too, through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles, and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.withaslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. Introducing Uplearn. Uplearn is an online curriculum learning resource for A-levels that improves student outcomes whilst reducing teacher workloads. Teachers use Uplearn to facilitate independent learning and consolidation of classroom material. Over 150 schools have seen grade improvements with Uplearn, including St Paul's Girls School, Michaela Community School and ARC Schools. Book a demo at uplearn.co.uk and quote TTR for 10% off. That's Uplearn. U-P-L-E-A-R-N dot co dot U-K. Whatever learning looks like this year, bring lessons to life with Nearpod. An exciting new addition to the Renaissance family, Nearpod offers real-time insights into student understanding through interactive lessons and videos, gamification and activities, all in a single, easy-to-use platform. To help kickstart the new year, we're offering all primary and secondary schools in the UK and Ireland Ireland, full free access to Nearpod for the whole spring term. So, no matter what 2022 brings, Nearpod makes switching between in-class and remote teaching simple. Visit www.renlearn.co.uk forward slash Nearpod and sign up for your free trial today. If you're listening to this, then we know we share one thing in common, a passion for the type of outstanding education that every child deserves. That's what makes us the leading provider of specialist education and care. We need people like you to help us achieve even more. With us, you'll be given all the resources and support you need, offered a clear path to career progression, and be rewarded with some of the best salaries and benefits the industry has to offer. We are with a Slack group. If you'd like to find out more, we'd love to hear from you. Visit www.withaslackgroup.co.uk forward slash careers and be part of our future.
This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The Evening Standard reports on comments made by the Duke of Westminster in an article featured on the paper's website. The article focuses on the government's pledge to provide £79 million to help improve mental health support for children and young people in England. The pledge, made 12 months ago, would help grow the number of mental health support teams in schools from 59 to 400 by April 2023. In the article, the Duke highlights data provided by Children's Mental Health Charity Place to Be and the National Association of Head Teachers, which shows that between April and October of last year, over 400,000 under-18s were referred for specialist mental health care in England a 70% increase in the same period in the pre-pandemic 2019. Isolation, the breakdown of formal and informal support, periods of lost education and the social and academic pressures of returning to school have all taken their toll. The Duke focuses on the importance of early intervention and argues the case for funding to be developed here to prevent a further increase in young people requiring crisis-based specialist treatment. The article is featured as part of coverage of Children's Mental Health Week and includes references to research by Oxford University's Department of Psychology, which suggests that children from low-income families or those with special educational needs may have experienced greater mental health problems than others and are likely to recover at a slower rate than other groups. The article concludes by reiterating the need for early intervention and a call to ensure that young people have their voices heard. With Valentine's Day approaching, pupils in Jersey have been visiting elderly members of the community to spread some joy. Operation Valentine is an annual event run by students from one of the island schools. The event, which includes a Valentine's meal, has been held for more than 30 years. This year, due to the COVID restrictions, the meal cannot be hosted, but instead they're delivering Valentine's afternoon tea hampers to local care homes. 160 hampers were delivered on Friday and the day is regarded as very special as this small gift has a huge impact. In Northern Ireland, rugby legend Rory Best has launched a sports project aimed at making sport more accessible for young people with disabilities. Best is an ambassador for Sported, a UK-wide charity that supports grassroots sports groups. The charity will support four groups in Northern Ireland in becoming more accessible for disabled young people. Sported's aim for its Include project is to see more young people with disabilities participate in sports and, as a result, have increased self-confidence and improved physical and mental health. Best said he was honoured to support the launch of this wonderful project. A press release on the European Union's official website outlines the EU Africa Global Gateway Investment Package, which will focus on education, skills and technical vocational training. The release focuses on how EU funding will support joint action on improving the quality of teaching in participating countries, empowering girls and vulnerable groups through education, developing skills and vocational education, and improving youth exchanges in Africa and between Africa and Europe. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio Weekend News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, it's Safe Internet Week with the official day being on Tuesday the 8th of February. This year, the UK Safer Internet Centre is questioning whether gaming online is all fun and games. They ask young people to explore respect and relationships in online gaming. A lot of schools may be having drop down days and you may be expected to deliver an online safety lesson. This is great, but are you confident in your knowledge? There's nothing worse than having to teach a lesson out of your comfort zone, especially when you're discussing a topic where the learners may know more than the teacher. Saferinternet.org.uk, the brains behind Safer Internet Day, have come to the rescue with a series of films under the heading of Virtual Assemblies on their website. Starting with a story about in-app purchases getting out of hand for 3 to 7 year olds, and then for 7 to 11 and 11 to 18s having a discussion on online behaviour and respect. This resource is informative and will allow those of us that are less confident to play the film and facilitate a discussion. As always, if you're going to use an online resource, make sure you've watched it first to make sure it's appropriate for your pupils.
For a visual version of this episode, check out the TT Radio 2022 Twitter feed. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Okay, and we're back. Um, yeah, so uh, sometimes um, the news stories uh, can be, um, you know, a bit sort of anxiety inducing because, you know, they need to be heard. But this week was a mi- good mix, actually, of some uplifting stories as well. I love the rugby player story one today. Right. Um, Emily, you there? Hello, I am back. I'm here. Sweet. Okay. So we've um, last section of the show. Um, Now, what else did I have down here? So, yeah. So you've you've sort of approached and done a lot of, um, you said you've done a lot of um, teaching young people um, about songwriting and getting them to do it. I guess if somebody asked you, how does someone become a better songwriter or sort of how how do I make my songs better and more or more approachable? I guess what would be the number one piece of advice you would give them? I think there's a couple of things. Uh, one is something that I am still uh, getting my head around and trying hard <laughs> to do, which is to um, edit, edit, edit <laughs> and not yeah. accept the first version of things that you do. Um as a sort of creative person, I'm quite, I do something and then I go, great, I've done it. Full stop, move on. It's just the way I sort of work. But actually to be more reflective about your practice, I think can't help but make things better. So I'm really trying to put that into my own practice now to not think that as soon as (laughs) I've done something, it's finished, but to go back and look at every bit and look at every word and is that the best word for that job look at the melody have I just thrown something in there because it happens to fit or is there a better way I can do it Um, to really sort of consider the craft of the songwriting I'm also really um, a a big words person and I think that you need to uh, not underestimate how much singability affects the power of a song some words just are not designed to be sung (laughs) some words just they feel horrible in your mouth and so I think that if you are writing a song that you know is designed to be heard to be sung out loud then sing it out loud and see how do those words (laughs) feel and if there's a bit that you regularly like feels clunky or you sort of regularly get wrong look at that and look at what the word is that you're using look at the syllables the sounds of the word Dentist. <laughs> yes, that's not one of the nicer words to sing, is it? <laughs> oh dear, I, 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 I will admit I didn't come up with that joke myself. That was a previous internet joke that I'd heard, but it reminded me of that. <laughs> so that, yeah, there you go. There are my two things: edit, edit, go back, and be reflective of your practice, and also. Think about the singability of your lyrics. Try it out loud. Okay, brilliant. Um, So let's talk a bit about um, Friday afternoons and uh, what you do with the Britain peers. So can you explain for those that have never heard of it what the Friday Afternoons Project is all about? I certainly can. And actually, if there are people out there listening um, who are looking for free music resources, I urge you to head to fridayafternoonsmusic.co.uk where there is a complete plethora of um, stuff out there to use. Songs with backing tracks, performance tracks, but also composition resources is something that the project's really focusing on at the moment. Um, And going back to your whole listening thing, um, the ethos behind Friday Afternoons follows Benjamin Britten's ethos. Um, He had a triangle of um, the way he looked at the world, which was performer, listener, composer, and the relationship between those three things. And that everybody can be all three of those things is what Friday Afternoons likes to um, sort of put out there. So we commission, it's based at Snape Maltings in Suffolk, which is where Benjamin Britten was from. And Benjamin Britten wrote a set of songs called the Friday Afternoons songs, and they were to engage his brother's 
uh, students who were at an all boys school and they sang on a Friday afternoon and his brother said that they weren't really getting involved in the singing. So Benjamin Britten said he'd write them some songs that got them more engaged. I mean, it's an age old story, but we're talking a hundred years ago here. Um, So that ethos, um, we now commission new composers to write songs to do the same sort of thing. So they're from a classical contemporary background, as in they, they they pull on the same influences as Benjamin Britten. But the main thing is that they're fun and engaging for young people to sing, but within this sort of contemporary classical world. So they're a bit different to the sing-up style of songs, but the resourcing is the same in that you get the sheet music and the backing tracks and a performance track. Um, and there's loads of stuff to explore on that website. So if it's a new project to you, um, I would urge teachers to register on the website and go and have a good old look and see what they could find. But if they're looking to get composition into the classroom, there's loads of resources on there to help that happen. Nice. Yeah, because Benjamin Britten was all about, one of his big things was all about, you know, he loved children and he loved um writing yeah. for children yeah he wrote children's operas and things that were specifically for children to listen to but also to take part in and uh, the whole young person's guide to the orchestra and all of that sort of thing um he also wanted to sort of uh, in some ways i suppose democratize the the whole music uh, and access to music and get more people involved so again the whole mm. um ethos of of people getting involved in music not just singing it but also making it is something that friday afternoons is really is really strong on so yeah, that's a lovely project to work to work on yeah because um that's often one of the biggest battles with um with uh, music that's older than you know the 19 uh 50s i'd say is that um you know class classical music um um where and of course if you're a musician we're talking broadly baroque classical mm-hmm. romantic etc um one of the biggest battles is fighting against its elitist uh status among certain groups yeah definitely and, and breaking down those barriers and you know making sure that it's seen as something that is for everybody and not like you're saying a sort of you know an elitist activity but there's a load of positive work going on I think across music education at the moment to try and increase access and inclusion and and really try and you know break down some of those because they do still exist a little bit I mean there is still a sort of um, slight elitism around um, some access about who ends up learning instruments and about all of that sort of thing yeah. so I think we can't ha- um, we really can't stop trying to get access more broadly um, out there because you know what, I, you mentioned that and I have noticed that with BBC Young Musician of the Year quite mm-hmm. a bit. Now, um, I used to, because I went to Junior Academy, Junior Royal Academy, I knew some people who were entering back when I was 17, 18. Yeah. But um, the, what I've noticed in recent years, now now I'm 32, so obviously I don't know many of any of the uh students that are uh, uh, school kids that are entering the competitions but mm. i've really noticed that it's so dominated by Cheetons, the purcell school wells cathedral school and you know other private schools with ma- long established you know use uh music departments um yeah. and you know it's very rare that you get people like sheku kane mason who was you know state educated but just has such a passion and that came through and um, yeah and they've been one the whole family have been fantastic ambassadors for that very thing which is you know access for all children to a, a proper music education because you don't know you like something unless you've had the opportunity to try it and you don't know you're good at something unless you've had the opportunity to try it so I really think we have to keep banging that drum yeah and yeah, and BBC Ten Pieces is an example of a resource I've used a lot. Um, and uh, I, you know, and uh, one of one of my things is also I love soundtracks, and I play mm. trombone in the London Video Game Orchestra at the moment, where we exclusively play video game music. Um, that sounds amazing. That's a, it, that's it, an actual orchestra. That's an actual orchestra. Yeah, and I'm lead trombone in it. So that's how been great brilliant. Fun. That's fantastic. Yeah. When was that set up then? How old is that? Is that it? that was set up in September 2019. 
and then they went virtual when COVID hit. Yeah, and got we and I joined in September 2021 when we all got back together um, yeah. as a, as a live orchestra. But yeah, we played. I, I don't know how knowledgeable you are about video games. Um, um, it's not great, I will be honest, but I do know <laughs> that it's a huge area for music and for composition and for, um, for, well, for people to make a living within music, the whole video game thing. I know how important it is as a sector. Yeah, we, um, but we, we played some, you know, classics like um, some Super Mario music and also some music from Minecraft in our last concert. Um, right. and all sorts but and what I'm, I was really glad to see with BBC 10 pieces that Hans Zimmer did a um, did a piece for that because I, I, I'm all about the, the really good soundtracks and yeah, heard this such a good piece um, that sounds but, a really wonderful project is, is there any do, do you do anything in that orchestra that it connects with education and, and young people because I think that could be really exciting for them to see that that's a not at the moment however <laughs> it is something that i think i definitely like to develop at the moment yeah. like the orchestra had been had gone virtual for um during covid yeah but um so it was and, and they're kind of getting back on their feet we're kind of getting back on our feet a bit getting regular performances and and uh, concerts going but it is definitely something that I might propose to um, Galen, the founder, and James, the musical director, to um, to carry on. Um, yeah. uh, or, or at least start doing maybe some educational stuff. The problem is, like, it's not a professional orchestra, so um, people have other jobs that they go to. Yeah. But it is something we can certainly look into. I think it's a really great thing for to show exactly how um because it is essentially classical music that you will be playing it's just yeah um it's got this link to to soundtrack and gaming like you're saying I think it could be a great way in for lots of young people yeah and uh and this is what we all have to do as musicians and music teachers and also as we said earlier make it accessible for adults and uh pri- especially primary school teachers who are not confident at all about yeah. teaching music um i mean part of me says you know if they've got a cynical attitude towards it it might be really hard to help them but there's many out there that want to do better just don't know where to start and i guess that's people up to like us that it's up to us to help them oh definitely and just like you're saying sp- spread the love spread the confidence get people <laughs> enjoying making music themselves and then you can't help but want to pass that on when you see and feel how great it is to make music with other people you want to help other people do it don't you yeah all right so um going back to um sing up day i guess my last question for you is what specifically can you remember that you were doing on each on the sing up days themselves then sort of have you been leading other uh, others in their contributions or yeah actually um so i work really closely with west sussex music hub um i am a partner of that hub and i uh do sing up day performances as part of that role. So um, for the last couple of, well, not the COVID year, the COVID year, I made the video with my band in the studio um, doing a video of Unstoppable and people did a a sort of play along with me, which was really good, actually. I really enjoyed that. But in a non-COVID time, I've been in schools um, where they've been a host school and then other local schools have gone to that host school and we've done a workshop um, where we finished by all singing the Sing Up Day song and where we can, we videoed that and sent that in to be part of the massed Sing Up Day videos that get joined up, which has nice. been great. It's been really, really lovely. Are you doing Sing Up Day 2022 song? I am not doing Sing Up Day's 2022 oh. song. I believe that there is um, it's time for somebody else <laughs> to write something. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure. I don't think they've announced who it is yet. And um, I do know that they've announced when it is. It's the uh, 29th of June, is it not? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I know that they've got... So they will... The song will... Uh, knowing the timelines, the song will have been written. So that Sing Up will know what the song is and who the um, composer is. But no, I can tell you, which is not me this year. Um, oh. 
book. But, you know, there's plenty on there to, to keep you busy with, with my songs. <laughs> yeah, no. All right. Well, um, I think we're going to um, bring most of the show to a close. Um, if you don't mind, Emily, I'd like to play and sing live one of your songs before we... Um, before oh. we head off are you okay with me doing that what are you gonna what are you gonna perform um i'm i'm torn between some of them actually i think Mm -hmm. um yeah do you know what since um we didn't play thank you lucky stars in the uh in the uh show reel i feel bad i feel bad that i forgot it it's like forgetting one of your children (laughs) i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna play that one so um but first before uh, yeah, no, let's let's just get into it. So, um, for those that don't know, this is Emily's uh, harvest song. Give me this song over cauliflower stuffy any day. <laughs> that is a, truly a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> right, enjoy. Um... Look around you. Tell me what you see. A world that's full of possibility Water to drink and food to eat Clothes to wear, shoes on your feet We give thanks to you Share what you can with people you love And life is better Give what you've got to be who thought of life is better. Be thoughtful and grateful. Thank you, lucky stars for all that we done this planet that is all. See the plants and food that farmers grow. Takes a lot of hard work, don't you know? Every day they work the land, rain and sun, and a helping hand. We give thanks to you. Share what you have with people you love, and life is better. Give what you've got to people who not to life gets better. Be thoughtful and grateful. Thank you, lucky stars, for all the food that we eat and the oats and the wheat and the salad that is ours. Thank you for the love you give to me. Thank you for your generosity. When I'm sad and feeling blue, I know I can turn to you. We give thanks to you. Share what you have with people you love, and life gets better. Give what you got to people who thought that life gets better. Be thoughtful and grateful. Thank you, lucky stars, for all the food that we eat and the oats and the wheat and the folks that we meet and this planet that is all. Woo! <laughs> There you go. <laughs> That's I know, amazing. It's I know so lovely. Singing, I know the singing voice isn't the greatest, but there you go. It's brilliant. It's great to hear somebody else um, singing the song and the way that you play it. It makes it sound like an ELO song or something. It was great. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emily, it's been an uh, absolute joy having you on the show. Thank you so much um, for being on my Teach Sort radio show. 
Thank you for having me. It's been lovely to spend some time chatting yeah. about all of this. It's really great. So thank you yeah, very much. And, um, you know, although this is um, Saturday lunch times are a difficult time for live listeners to tune in, but um, you can expect this to be downloaded around about 300 to 400 uh, uh, by 300 to 400 people. So, yeah. Um, oh, fabulous. Well, hello to all of those people. <laughs> brilliant. Well, um, thanks again, Emily. And thank you to everyone who lists anybody who listened live and thank you to everyone who downloaded and listened. Um, and see you next time. Lovely. Thanks very much. Bye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.